call the May 9, 2017 Shelburne Select Board meeting to order tonight. We're having auditions for Dancing with the Stars Shelburne version. I understand Linda is going to be a primary contestant this year. <laughs> and uh, so, first item up is a special item. We usually start at 7, but we thought there was a lot of community interest in this item, and we wanted to give everybody an opportunity to speak. It's consider identifying and approving a preferred alternative for the Bay Road Mobility Study. Uh, I just wanted to give everybody a, a little uh, note of caution. We understand this is an emotional issue for a lot of people. And I just ask everyone to please remember that when this meeting is over, we'll all still be neighbors. So I ask that everyone please be civil. Everyone please understand that you will have an opportunity to speak, but because of time constraints, you're limited to three minutes. And frankly, I hope most people are able to talk faster than that. Uh, anyway, civility is the key. Also, we have a consultant for this study. The consultant was unable to make it, and we only learned of this, I believe, in the last few days. So Dean Pierce, our Director of Planning and Zoning, is going to take over presenting this. This puts Dean in a very difficult uh, position, having to sneak in here. So I hope everyone understands that we're very fortunate to have Dean. He knows more, I will tell you, in my opinion, than anyone in town about planning and zoning in the town of Shelburne. He is a walking encyclopedia. So I'd like to turn over the presentation to Dean. Thank you, Gary. I'm going to jump right in, hit some slides, I'm going to try it with the light all off. And if people... Grab a mic, Dean. I do have a mic. OK. <laughs> I do have a mic. And I apologize that it's going to be kind of at a weird angle, but this is the best that we So if you're not here for this topic, um, you should try a different room. I am a pinch hitter, and so that gives me some liberties uh, that include taking a somewhat different approach uh, that might have been the one taken by Beth Eisler, the consultant. Uh, I want to take a step back, and I want to give some context for the study and some of the assumptions behind it. Uh, I want to explain what the study is and what it isn't. Uh, I want to present the latest concept, which is on the town's website. I was just going to show a, an image earlier, and I forgot to do it, of the town's website where you can download this. As far as I know, there are not paper copies of the latest proposal available, but I'm sure they can be furnished. And like I said, they are on the town's website. Um, I will run through that in kind of a macro and micro sense. Uh, then I'll offer some thoughts towards the end on what doing nothing uh, will do for the town or won't do for the town. Uh, I wanted to give people some sense of how did we get here? Or did you know? Did, did you know that in 2003 when the town plan was being updated, there was a town-wide survey, and one of the questions about that survey, or included in that survey, asked people what they thought the top issues were, and that the issue of developing a recreational path network was the one, two, three, four, five, six, seventh issue in the town. It was ahead of enhancing the viability of the business community. It was ahead of attracting employment. It was ahead of developing more affordable housing. But the idea of developing a recreational path network it's been talked about for a while, and it's been deemed important. In 2010, there was a separate survey that was done, and it didn't ask the same questions, but in a related question, um, the responses indicate that about, um, if I can do my math here, about 65% of people who responded felt that increasing connections between neighborhoods should be either required of all development or within the growth center in the town. But the idea of connections between neighborhoods th through paths was identified as important. The town's plan, it shouldn't surprise people then, includes a language that reflects that kind of worldview. 
there was a 2012 version of the plan. It's been readopted essentially on a couple of occasions. But one of the goals in the town plan is to develop and maintain a multimodal transportation system that facilitates safe and efficient movement. And you can read the rest. But it, there, there it is, a goal for the town in the town plan for developing a multimodal transportation system. And more specifically, there's an objective. And that objective says to, integrate, to create an integrated network of sidewalks, paths, bike lanes and trails that connect uh, the town with surrounding towns and then residential areas within the town. I wish I could figure out how to make this thing advance with this little clicker, but I haven't figured that out, so you'll have to forgive me as I dip. Recommended actions included in the town plan, a couple of them I've got here, construct shared paths, sidewalks, and on-road facilities as parts of an integrated network, and to do that consistent with a set of state guidelines. Again, this is all idea of why, how did this get started? Well, it also got started because around 2016, as part of the select board's retreat, they identified making um, Bay, Bay Road a priority, or they made Bay, Bay Road a priority, or they considered it a priority. Uh, and I think that was early in the year. Um, there had been, in response to that, there had been some thought given to perhaps making Bay Road the subject of a, of a grant application that had been filed earlier. And in the end, the thing that we submitted the grant application for didn't get selected, so it wasn't an opportunity to swap. But people were thinking we should try to do something about Bay Road. Since we didn't get that grant funded, the town went to the Regional Planning Commission and the Regional Planning Commission's uh, staff did a study and they prepared a technical memo. Uh, one of the things that happened as a result of that technical memo was the pilot project, the looking at what could we do around the railroad overpass. So there was the pilot project that started in 2016. John Kerr, select board member, worked very, very closely with Paul Goodrich, our highway director, to look at opportunities, quick fixes and things that we could do also in 2016. And then there was the conclusion of the pilot project. That was, that was stuff that was happening really before this project got, got rolling. But it points to why doing a study like this isn't, isn't the craziest of ideas. Um, something I wanted to mention in the kind of the not always obvious department is that town highways are for the public and the public is more than cars. Somewhat related to that idea is that in 2011, the legislature passed something that's called the Complete Streets Law. And as a result of the Complete Streets Law, it says to towns and to the agency of transportation, basically any entity that's going to be building uh, and maintaining in the highway system and the transportation system, that when you, make ch when you maintain that system and when you make changes to the system, you have to think about all users, of, regardless of their age, their ability, and what type of transportation they intend to use. And that the safety and the accommodation of all transportation system users, regardless of age or mode choice or preference, needs to be considered. Going forward, if anyone, uh, if Dean is fine with people asking questions, you must use a microphone, though, and identify yourself so we can keep track of minutes and the uh, two million people watching on TV can hear you. So for Marianne's <laughs> benefit, that's Bruce Lisman, and the um, I'll continue to hold the mic here. Um, there are some exceptions. Minor types of maintenance can um, um, avoid this. And so for the purposes of this presentation, I am oversimplifying, um, but the, the, the mandate is there on municipalities as well as the ag Agency of Transportation to be uh, thinking about all users. A minor paving project is not going to impose on the community uh, a responsibility to add things to it that create bike lanes and things of that sort. But if we're looking ahead to the future of the corridor, then the needs of all the users need to be considered. And since people would rather not compete for space with cars, the research shows that a dedicated space, such as a separate path, means that you'll get increased usage. Now, I will, I will uh, concede that not all bike users or bike riders are the same. There will be some experienced cyclists who will use a road even if there's a path available. But there are less experienced cyclists 
who when a path is available will in fact use it. And until there's a path available, they're not likely to use a particular road corridor. Similarly, and we've got some numbers that come from a presentation that um, included data that just happened to be from Shelburne that looked at the number of people using the sidewalk system both before an improvement was made and after. And this, this notion of if you build it, they will come does, does pan out with bicycle and pedestrian facilities. And um, those different blocks of color show different times of the day, but you can see the overall impression that um, the bars give you. There is an increase in use when a facility is provided. So, with that as background, back in 2017, we tried again, or we tried um, to formalize our thinking about what should be done with this corridor by making a grant application. Those applications go to the Regional Planning Commission as part of something called the UPWP. And I've just thrown up the paragraph that I've clipped directly from the grant application so that people have an understanding of what what was the original proposal? And the original proposal was, it first of all, recognizes that this is a compute, commuter route and it's used by pedestrians and, and cyclists, also used by people with larger vehicles pulling boats going to the, to the ramp. Um, but it also has some constraints. And so there are all these potential users competing for a limited amount of space and we want to do a study to try to sort things out. And so the project proposed to do a study looking at safety and mobility, and that it would examine alternatives that the corridor might be improved. I wanted to just also say that Bay Road is what's called a major collector. Highways often get classified for different planning purposes, and it's a major collector. What that means that it, is that it does a couple of things. It provides people a way to get someplace as well as to get to the land along it. So I'm guessing that a bunch of the people who are in this room have homes that are right on Bay Road, and to them, it's like the neighborhood street that brings them to their driveway, but to others, it's a road that's on the way to someplace else. And that's what happens with major collectors. And the last point that I made is, because it's got those features, there's a tension. There's a tension between the kinds of people who are using it um, that's inherent in the type of purpose it serves. We did get the funding, or we got uh, the offer of support. This, this project doesn't actually mean that the town gets a check. We get the services of a consultant. And it was selected for, um, to move forward in May of 2016. I want to make clear, because I think that there's been some sense out in the, in the world that the reason that the study was funded because, is because of another regional planning effort that has to do with their regional active transportation plan. Nothing of the sort. Like I said, there's all this other stuff going on entirely separate from any regional um, initiative. The consultant was part of a pool. The Regional Planning Commission has a, a stable of consultants, I like to think of, and they matched that consultant with us, and she set off or it was originally one, one member of the staff and then another um, who took over the project. It follows what's called the scoping process. The scoping process is written up in manuals maintained by the Agency of Transportation and the Regional Planning Commission. And it's very formal. It has things like develop a purpose and need statement and analyze the alternatives and choose a preferred alternative and all of this stuff. And that's just explaining why this study has gone forward the way that it's gone. But one important point to mention is that the purpose of the study, and this, this happened uh, following some meetings I think last fall, was to develop a safe route for all users, including people walking or biking along Bay Road between Harbor and Shelburne Road. And the need for that study is justified by um, the need for creating a safe space to use the corridor regardless of their mode, to improve connectivity, to have a consistent facility type, and to create equity among different users. So, I won't say anything more about the scoping process other than it is formal, it's got a lot of steps, and when the scoping process is done, there's usually a lot more that needs to happen. When a scoping report is finished, people don't take the results of that and hand it to someone to, to build. So, Regardless of the outcome of this process, it's not going to be a product that we hand to someone to build. And that's just a chart to show how complicated things can be. 
The local concerns meeting, it's one of those required steps, was held back in October of last year. Things that people who came to that meeting said was that the corridor is a place that's uncomfortable for people walking and bicycling. There's, there's concern about the speed of vehicles. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. There's concern about sight distances, and that can be a function of places like the railroad overpass where you can't see as well unless you really slow down. Poor connectivity, and the railroad uh, overpass was mentioned specifically separately. So now I'm going to talk about what the latest alternative is. And if people have attended most of the meetings as part of this project, they've understood that it's gone through different iterations. And the way I look at this latest alternative is that the consultant has, um, has taken out some things that really, well, at the direction of the select board, which said we didn't like three, I think, of her initial ideas. Um, she's refined what she's proposing, and she's also breaking the corridor up in recognition of the fact that it's really, it's a series of corridors. It's one road in one corridor, yes, but the conditions along the way vary. So, even though we've got this corridor from Route 7 to Shelburne Farms, she really breaks it into pieces. And I'll quickly go through these. These are some of the critiques from the earlier presentation. The alternatives that she had come up with were too massive. They weren't context sensitive. There were privacy concerns. I mentioned design guidelines. The town plan mentions the importance of following design guidelines. The, the state of Vermont has guidelines that it recommends communities follow. Um, and they don't have to follow them, but they will typically make following those guidelines a condition of getting funding. So anytime we're talking about doing something that is not following the guidelines, then the community is going to be considering what the financial implication is. Because I can tell you that many, many years ago, there was the idea for a path on Webster Road in the early 90s. And the town came up with a proposal to build a path. Uh, that proposal moved forward, but at the time, the select board then said, well, could you get outside funding? And the answer to that question was, yeah, but we have to do a study of a certain type. And that study usually recommends a bigger project because it has to meet all the standards. So following the guidelines, it's kind of a double-edged sword because it will make you eligible for funding but it will sometimes or usually mean that you have to build more of something than you would otherwise. So what the consultant did was take this corridor that had previously been described as one long stretch and broken it up into four pieces. And segment one on the west hand side which essentially starts at the entrance to Shelburne Farms and goes to where the Tai Hall path um, crosses Bay Road, uh, would be a stone dust path that would be from eight to 10 feet wide. Um, and it would have a three to five foot wide buffer strip or grass strip between the path and the edge of the, the paved roadway. So I think this is a concept that was one of the alternatives early on, but basically for the entire corridor, um, she's relegating it to she. Beth Eisler, the consultant, is proposing that it would be on the western portion of the corridor. And this is a drawing that may or may not be clear to people. It is what you would see if you were going to the town's website. Um, but this graphic is maybe helpful for some people to understand. You have the roadway. This is that three to five foot grass strip that I was talking about, an eight to 10 feet wide stone dust pathway. This is looking west, and it shows, therefore, that it's on the north side of the road. And like I said, it's the proposal for the area west of the Thai Hall crossing near Shelburne Bay Park. Segment two. This is kind of a tricky section. This is where uh, the La Platte River Bridge is proposed to be reconstructed. And the proposal that uh, is included in the revised alternative is two to four foot wide shoulders and on part of it, a six foot wide concrete path. And we'll drill down a little bit. Uh, just before I do that, 
I'll mention, this is a segment that has been the focus of a separate scoping report, a scoping report for the reconstruction of the La Platte River Bridge. Um, that goes back to 2010. It's hard to believe that it's been that long, but it has. And the select board at that time, when it received the, the report or was preparing to, to, to help decide the outcome of the report, chose what's called alternative five, which is an alternative that would include the roadway and a five foot sidewalk. And as part of that roadway, there would be accommodation for bicyclists and the sidewalks would, accom would accommodate pedestrians. Um, so this is the bridge itself. To the east of the bridge, there is an approach area. As part of that um, approach area, the consultant has shown on this new drawing a two foot wide shoulder on the north side, nine foot travel lanes. That's a, that's a relatively narrow travel lane um, and a four foot wide shoulder on the south. And so this is essentially the place where people getting off a sidewalk that extends to the east would, there'd be no more sidewalk, so they'd be walking along a four foot wide path until they got to the bridge. After the bridge, they'd be able to get onto the stone dust path. Uh, just speaking of the sidewalk, um, it runs from this drawing, or this sheet in the drawing eastwards towards Yacht Haven. And like I was, I think I said earlier, it's a six foot wide sidewalk. This drawing here shows that six feet, it would be curbed that allows it to be closer. It also would be elevated above the road, which provides some protection. Uh, and there would be a shoulder of four feet between that sidewalk and the travel lane. In that case, the travel lanes are still at nine feet. Going to segment three, we, we see a return to the eight to 10 foot stone dust path with a three foot or five, up to five foot wide buffer. But instead of being on the north side, it's on the south side in this um, latest proposal. And there would be a transition area at the railroad bridge. I didn't, I didn't dwell on the fact that in the earlier segment, the consultant is, is recognizing that really the, the long-term fix for the bridge is the bridge, and we'll have to figure out some kind of striping in that bridge area that um, is gonna be an interim measure if we do anything at all before the bridge is built. In other words, she has not um, proposed a bridge before the bridge, it's something that would, the ultimate solution is, is the replacement of the bridge. So this is continuing eastward in, um, we get to uh, Yacht Haven Drive. That's where the sidewalk would end. There would be a crossing and we, we start the eight to 10 foot wide stone dust path on the south side. Segment four, try to wrap things up here. Um, this is where the consultant's proposal narrows the path down to six feet with a two to three foot buffer rather than a three to five foot buffer and eight feet. Uh, it proposes two foot shoulders um, and then it's recognizing that uh, there's also some work to be done at the intersection between Bay Road and Route 7. This is, this is a detail. Again, these are hard to read sitting there and seeing it for the first time. This is the profile, so if you go home and you load it on your computer or if you want to get copies here, we'll gladly make them. You'll be able to look at this in greater detail, but I appreciate that it is hard to absorb right now. Where do we go next? The purpose of this session is to discuss this latest alternative. Um, Normally these processes include a final report, but before, I wanted to just throw that on the table. It, um, anticipating the question, is pausing an option? Yeah, pausing this project in some way is an option, but I would just mention that there will continue to be a variety of people 
who will use the road. The problems that gave rise to the study in the first place probably aren't going to go away. The language in the town plan will, unless it's changed, still be the language in the town plan and the complete streets law will still be there. This is an image from a company that records your, your run or your bike ride and you can upload it and keep track of all those things, but um, it shows where people ride and, and run more than walk, um, but it's, um, it's making the point. People will, even if nothing changes, people will continue to walk or run and ride on Bay Road because they're doing it now. The typical profile will remain. It's about 24 feet wide. It's really important for people to understand, though, when we're talking about roadways, that wider roadways mean faster driving. And that's something that, uh, unless there's um, unless something changes, cars will continue to be driving relatively fast and at a speed that the research will show will result in a great deal of harm to the person who's hit the cyclist relative to that of the car. So like my, my point is, faster driving does, is associated with higher injury risk. And just to explain that the roadway is posted at 35 miles an hour. There are a lot of counts of both the volume and the speed that vehicles travel and 43 miles per hour um, has, uh, at least east of the railroad overpass, is the 85th percentile speed. So 15% um, of the drivers are driving above that, above 43 miles per hour and the posted speed is 35. And the last slide before turning things over is that regardless of what happens with the study, it may be um, important for people to be thinking about including some basic elements of traffic calming. This is a picture from uh, a presentation that was done by the Village Safety Transportation Group looking at Marset Road. And like I was saying, narrow roads are associated with lower speeds, which are safer for pedestrians and cyclists. And one of the ideas that they've been promoting has simply been to stripe the roads where they aren't striped currently. The effect of striping the road is that it psychologically induces the driver to, to, to drive slower. It also tends to have them gravitate towards the center of the road and it creates a safer space for the person that's either walking or riding on the side. How many people wish to comment or ask questions this evening? One, two, four, five, seven, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, let's say fifteen people. We want to give the select board an opportunity uh, to speak also. Uh, it will be very difficult to finish this within our time frame if everyone speaks for three minutes. So to the extent that anyone can make your point in a minute, I urge you as a practicing litigator that it is more persuasive to speak quickly. <laughs> uh, before I turn it over to everyone, does uh, Dean, some people obviously will have comments, some people might have questions. Our rules of procedure, as you know, uh, all comments and questions are to be directed to the board. In this case, you are, uh, I believe, uh, more knowledgeable than anyone else about the details relating to this project. Would you be agreeable to answering questions when they arise? If I can answer it, I would be happy to answer it. Thank you very much. So if the rest of the board is good with uh, waiving that rule? Okay, great, thank you. Uh, so, does anyone, before I turn it over to the, uh, everyone, does anyone on the board have any informational type of questions or comments at this time? No, I'm anxious okay. to hear what folks have to say. Great, so let me turn it over to you guys. Who would like to go first? Everyone will have a chance. Please, and when everyone, please identify yourself and come to the microphone. Um, Ann Dixon, 849 Bay Road. Um, I'm, I'm very supportive of doing something to improve accessibility on Bay Ro Road, but I'm sort of curious, at the beginning of Section 3, where I live, what is the logic for suddenly having a much wider pathway? Um, if we think we're safer having a narrower pathway for 
Section two, does it suddenly have to widen out my yard? Uh, thank you very much. Dean, do you, uh, any uh, response you might have? Um, first, I guess I want to just make sure you're talking about the path or the, the lanes. Why eight foot stone, stone, dust, stone dust path? Yeah. Um, well, when you say the other side, you're east of Yacht Haven. Yeah. Okay. So the the consultant in this um, study has recommended six feet wide for the sidewalk, uh, which is uh, slightly higher than Shelburne sidewalk standard um, of five feet, but it's a width that a lot of communities are adopting for sidewalks. And I know I haven't yet answered the question. 10 feet wide is the minimum in uh, the consultant's mind for a facility of this type. It is the standard uh, and that you wouldn't, you wouldn't build to eight feet unless you are really boxed in and constrained. So I guess the, the way I would answer your question is, is that it's eight feet greater, it's eight feet rather than um, six feet because it's a path, not a sidewalk. Sidewalks are places where you are typically not accommodating cyclists unless it's a little kid with a parent toddling along. Once it becomes a path, it is a facility that has multiple use and so you need at the least that extra space because you're dealing with both pedestrians and cyclists. So if you're asking why is it eight rather than six, the short answer is it's because it's a path and it would have more cyclist use mixed with pedestrians. If you're asking why is it not 10, then I would say, or is it 10? If it, I'm, I'm trying to remember. But it's wider because it would have mixture of uses compared to the sidewalk. And one other uh, procedural comment. Uh, we're going to give everyone a chance to speak once before anyone has an opportunity to speak twice. It's only fair. So who would like to go next? Please identify yourself. Sally Torney, and um, I'm the owner of a duplex at 346 Bay Road. And I think ours is probably one of the closest properties to the to Bay Road. And I have some very long-term tenants that live there that are really concerned. Um, I am a Shelburne resident as well, and I'm really for bike paths. I'm an avid cyclist myself. But I'm questioning if this is the right place to put one. Um, first of all, from the speeds that um, you mentioned on Bay Road and um, also number two on that survey from 2003 said uh, maintaining lower property taxes for Shelburne residents and that's way above number six so just want to bring that up. Okay. <laughs> um, the other thing that I, I don't like to uh, create problems without some sort of solution and this may be crazy but the actual railroad um, itself must have some sort of buffer on the side of it. Can't the path go right along that railroad? I mean, it, it's a you direct... Know, you might know we've had a couple issues with the railroad lately. <laughs> I know, but... <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. Yeah. Thank you very much for yeah. your comment. Uh, who would like to go next? Uh, that's it? We're done? <laughs> who, who... What the heck is going to go next? <laughs> Please identify yourself. Mike Stoll. I live at 20 Crown Road. And faces Bay Road there. Curiosity, the speed limit there is 35. What has been a discussion, if any, about reducing it to 25 miles per hour at least? Because, this, I mean, the whole thing here is a safety issue. And living on the corner, I can see the vehicles coming off Route 7, and some of them use it as a speed ramp to hit Bay Road. So I'm kind of right. curious why it hasn't been reduced to 25 at least. Thanks, Mike. I'm going to let Joe uh, respond to that. I know there's a lot of uh, requirements in regard to speed limits. Yeah, and we have this, these concerns in other neighborhoods as well. well. As Dean's data suggested, the 85th percentile drives at 43 miles per hour. Um, and so given that, we actually have to set speed limits to how people are driving the road. So we really would not have the option to lower the speed limit from 35. It's yeah. just, it's, it'd be, it's state law. It's not an option for us to reduce it. Mike, uh, it's a below real good question. It's something that the select board over the nine years I've been on the board, <coughs> this issue has come up repeatedly. And there are uh, regulations that prevent us from simply going out and changing uh, speed limits um, without having studies to show what the speed of the cars are. All right, so who's next? Yes, please.
ability to speak very quickly. My <laughs> name is Jennifer Muka. I live at 346 Bay Road. I am. That of what she spoke. <laughs> uh, I've lived there a very long time with my family. And I did go to the website. I did look at the maps. I have researched these things. And I see that the proposal line actually divides our cars in half. <laughs> the, the house itself, the structure, and the drive is very close to the roadway proper. There would be no place for us to park. It would also, quite frankly, encroach a little bit on the feeling of security and safety, the distance between the home and the pathways. Um, I'm also employed with the Vermont State Police and the Department of Public Safety. So I'm coming from that aspect as well. And I find that that could be strategically problematic depending on uh, the motives of people using the area perhaps in the night hours. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Uh, I can tell you that this board and at past meetings have discussed and expressed concerns about uh, private property rights. Uh, so that's one thing that this board is aware of. There's also issues in regard to right of way, which doesn't, which the town does have the right uh, to use. So the, there's a balance here. So who's next? Linda. And then, it's good to see you again. <laughs> Hi, I'm Linda Lavalette. I live at 451 Bay Road. And, um, First, I'd like to recognize that this plan has tried to accommodate some of our concerns as, as Bay Road residents, but it's still not the right plan, in my opinion, for Bay Road for a lot of reasons. Um, now, I, I will admit I didn't pay enough attention to the town plan to see what was coming on with all this other stuff, and I probably should have responded to some of the surveys. But it's very true if, if you build a path, they will come, but there's very, two very good reasons why a path right now on Bay Road is not a good time for safety reasons, and that is the bridge itself and the underpass. And in 2004, the select board and the region decided that they would leave Bay Road bike paths alone for those reasons, that if you put all this time and expense into creating paths and bikeways, you're going to get that increased traffic only to have congestion points that will be more risky because you've got the more traffic. And Bay Road has a lot of traffic. Nobody wants to see anybody get hurt. We really don't. But we feel that it's the speed of the cars and not necessarily, um, and this plan doesn't, doesn't address that. And, and some of the other things, the ditch, for example, Bay Road has blizzard winds blowing snow off the lake and in the winter we tend to lose a lane of traffic and the plows do their best but they come along and they they plow and then all of a sudden you've got a ditch filled with snow and a lot of that traffic is parents with their kids coming to and from school they're going to get caught in a ditch that they don't realize is there because it's going to be full of snow I mean I have cars go off I can't tell you how many mailboxes I've lost right where a path would be and, and it was a father with a young boy this winter. They almost rolled right in front of my house. We saw them go off the road. Um, until other fa safety features can truly be addressed, it's my feeling that this is not the best plan for Bay Road. It's not the best timing for the plan. It's not the best use of town money. It's not the best priority to spend tax dollars with all these other reasons. Certainly not as popular with some of the residents as it is with the users of the road as the bike and walking. And we have a lot of people that live on Bay Road that walk and bike Bay Road. So it's not that they, we don't like bicyclists, all of us. <clears throat> so if you think it's the best, you should vote yes. But if it's not the best, then I would hope that you would vote your conscience and be brave enough to vote no to this plan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Linda. All right. Uh, I s Steve, how you doing? Good. Everybody shop at his store. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Identify uh, yourself for everyone. Please. Steve Mayfield, 805 Bay Road. Um, 
only for the last year though, so I wasn't able to be a town plan um, speaker at the time because I wasn't a resident, though I live here <laughs> much more than where I did. I have a couple of questions about it, but I guess one of my questions goes back to an earlier question. If the idea behind this is that the entire corridor is supposed to become bike path friendly, um, pedestrian friendly, as you're going through these segments, if the sidewalk is not bike friendly, then segment two doesn't make a continuous bike path. If the sidewalk in segment two does make it bike friendly, why can't it be a sidewalk in segment three? It seems like we're kind of talking out of both sides of our mouth as we're doing this. The sidewalk, while not perfect, takes six feet of my front yard. The bike path takes 15. <laughs> There's a huge difference there. Right. So if we can get away with a sidewalk with a curb, A, I think the curb is safer anyway because there is a lot of sliding that we saw this first year when ice during the winter time that I think a curb raised sidewalk is a safer alternative anyway, but it also is a lot less encroaching upon all the homeowners along this stretch than taking 15 feet and not having a curb, which means you're still gonna have cars sliding through my mailbox. I lost one too. Um, I've lost three. <laughs> I found it in the spring, but... Um, you found mine? No, I, f <laughs> I found mine. <laughs> Um, but And we're also bouncing back and forth across the road. Is that because the bridge was going to have the, the sidewalk on the south side versus the north side? Or is that because that was the easiest way to move the bike path around? Okay, well, thank you very much, Steve. But more uh, so the sidewalk. Uh, thanks. Uh, Dean, if you know why the consultant chose not in this revised alternative to uh, have the sidewalk go throughout um, the corridor rather than breaking it up. Uh, that would be great. And then also, uh, I do know that the last meeting we had, there was great discussions that uh, putting the path completely on the north side or the south side could prove problematic. And I think the consultant uh, took those comments into consideration in uh, alternating. But Dean, if you could uh, clarify. Yeah, that. So, so sidewalks are for pedestrians, by and large. They're not a multi-use facility. You wouldn't, you don't, generally speaking, encourage use of sidewalks by bicyclists. It's something that happens along with the pedestrian use, like a situation I described earlier, where a parent is going along the sidewalk with a young child. So the consultant's proposal for the area where the sidewalk picks up is to have both a sidewalk and lanes. The lanes are for the cyclists, the sidewalk is for the pedestrians. In the other places where the, um, there isn't a sidewalk proposed and a path is proposed, the path would accommodate both pedestrians and cyclists. Thank you. And as regards to uh, s switching from north to the south side? Yeah, so, so the issue, uh, there are a couple of aspects of that, at least a couple. One is that you, generally speaking, do not want a path to cross more driveways than it needs to because as people are riding along the path, uh, you, um, their progress is going to be impeded if people are backing out of their driveways. People customarily back out, so there's a safety issue there. And then there are also places where there are, um, t the town has an easement, for example, in the area that is to the west of the, I'm sorry, to the east of the railroad overpass because of a development project. So some, sometimes when a development is reviewed, the town will obtain an easement from the developer. So it's a place where a path can go. It just so happens that it's in a place where the path could go, and it's also a place where there are fewer driveways. So it shifts to have take advantage of the opportunities and to avoid the conflicts. Thank you, Dean. Who would like to go next? Please. Paul Boisvert, 743 Bay Road. I agree that it's a really dumb idea to go from a sidewalk to all of a sudden a big path. You're saying, oh, well, this, the sidewalk will work for some people, but the path will work for others. What are the people on the path going to do when they get to the sidewalk? Switch into the road? I doubt it. I agree that this, you use up a lot less space if you put the sidewalk versus this path. You take up a lot less of people's front lawns. Also, I, today, I measured the road today in front of my home. 
the road is 24 feet wide with no lines on the outside. By the Trihaw Trail, the road is 10 feet wide between the lines in the middle of the road. You've, those white lines shrink the roadway, which I agree slows traffic down. And there's a four foot shoulder on, the, on next to it. Well, why couldn't you do something like that? That would take even less space. You could, have, you could paint the line, you could put four feet of paved space next to the road, and that would solve the bicyclists, the walkers, everybody, all in one thing. And for it to change from Bay Colony Estates to gravel and then go sidewalk the other way. And the other thing is you're gonna, I agree, this is gonna bring a lot more people to the area. And what's gonna happen when all these people get to the bridge and they, they try to cross the bridge and somebody gets run over or killed, uh, they're gonna sue the town because you're, you're encouraging us, you're telling us to come use this path and then you're not leaving us any accommodations to cross the bridge over the river or the underpass and someone's bound to get hurt because they don't, if they're not in the area and they're using this for the first time and they're crossing that bridge, every day I walk my dog over that bridge twice a day, in the morning and out in the afternoon. I just wait for traffic. I listen, I wait for traffic not to be coming, I cross the bridge. But when you get a lot more people using this, they're not gonna do that. And there is not room for two cars and a pedestrian on that bridge right now. So someone's gonna get hurt or killed and they're gonna sue the Shelburne because that you're almost going to make themselves liable because you're inviting people to come and use this path. Oh, except for when you get to the bridge, everything's safe until you get to the bridge, and then you get killed there. <laughs> With trailers and boats. Uh, thank you for, for your comments. Of course, the board's not going to respond to liability issues. Uh, uh, I can tell you that I've walked across that bridge often. I used to keep a small boat. I was terrible on my boat. I kept running out of gas, and my friends had to save me. Uh, and I, I agree with you, that bridge is very dangerous. Yeah. I do remind people that we did have a bond vote a while back, which was narrowly defeated for uh, to address that bridge. And I can also tell you that our head of our highway department in charge of all our roads, <clears throat> there were four items on the bond that year. He thought that was by far the most important item. Uh, so please, ma'am. So Kate Longmate, I'm at 11 Bayfield Drive. I want to thank Dean for providing a context. I think that was sorely missing before. It helps us see where this vision originated from, and I think it helps us understand how this proposal is aligned with that vision. Um, I'm also at least encouraged that there's given some thought to trying to accommodate, as other folks have said, the issues that came up in our other meetings. So this feels like it's moving in the right direction. And it seems to me the issue with the bridge, the bridge needs to be resolved. Everyone in this room seems to be in agreement about that. And that probably a gravel path is not gonna occur across that bridge. But I would hope that whatever plan, if there is a bike path plan, that it's integrated with a future vision what that bridge is gonna look like so it makes sense. Um, my husband and I participated in Green Up Day. We did the stretch of road between Bayfield Drive and Route 7. And even with those bright green bags, I was very anxious about feeling safe, even as an adult walking alongside that road. So my primary concern, I'm in support of some kind of accessibility bike path, pedestrian path. Um, so safety, accessibility, the environment, encouraging people to walk, ride, use something other than their cars. A lot of that traffic is school traffic with parents delivering their children to school. It'd be nice if kids were riding to school. Um, so those are my primary concerns. At the same time, I expressed in other meetings, you know, I really do have empathy for folks. You know, this is your home. This is your property. Our property would be affected as well. We're on the corner of Bay Road and Bayfield Drive, but not to the extent our neighbors are. It does seem to make sense, even though it would affect us directly, that it's on this side, not the others, because two or three feet between the path and someone's home seemed unacceptable. So I'm encouraged at least where things are headed and in support of some vision of this going forward. Thank you very much, Steve. Thanks. She's good, Steve. <laughs> yes, please. 
Ellen McShane, 743 Bay Road. I'd like to first thank the select board because I feel like you've been listening to us and that oh, really you. is appreciative. We're, We're really yeah. trying. <laughs> it shows, so thank you. But I would like to also support that you uh, pause with this or turn it down right now because of the issue with the bridge. When I think about the young people in uh, Bay Colony Estates riding to school on this path, going over that bridge, in the morning it's not too bad, they're going into traffic, but at night or in the afternoon they're coming with their backs to traffic. And I just think that that is a terrible liability that I don't think any of us want to put our children at risk there. The other is that you're making it harder for the walkers right now with this ditch in the winter that we're going to have to try. We, I walk it every day myself, and now at least I can walk on the road and then move on to a path or a, a dirt part of the road, but if I've got a ditch next to me, because I just don't think you're going to be able to keep it clean because of the wind that's on Bay Road. Uh, we've heard as we've talked to different people around town that, oh, I know the road, I drive it all the time. But unless you live there, you don't really experience the cars going as fast as they do. You don't experience the wind. You don't experience the snow plow, trying to manage the snow, trying to keep the road open. So I hope that you'll consider this as something that we can work towards, but I don't think this is the time to be doing it now, mainly for safety. Thank you very much okay, for your you. thoughtful comments. Please. I'm Betsy Dempsey, two, uh, 230 Bay Road. And as part of this is a just sort of reiteration of, of, I agree with some of my neighbors. And I'm an avid walker. I walk every day down Bay Road. And I don't really have too much of a problem. Uh, but I, you know, I'd like to see maybe a little bit um, more comfort in, in my walking. But I think there are, this is still too massive. And I, would, I don't see any problem with getting rid of the whole ditch idea putting those putting the lines in the road to make it a little narrower and why can't we have a curb right next to that line and have you know you can have a decent sized bike path next to that curb so we're really not taking up much of the of our property but yeah we're still having all the benefits of having a decent bike and, and pedestrian lane but to have the you know a bike lane then this however many feet of grass or ditch and then another big section of it just seems it's still too massive and I just think we're not there yet we haven't figured out the best plan I'm not opposed to doing something but this is just I just don't think it's right yet thank Thanks. you Betsy who's next please sir Bainham, 176 Bay Road. Um, I guess my observation is, is that whenever you're trying to solve a problem, at least in my opinion, you're going to try to build something or fix something, um, it's a theory of constraints that um, if anybody was to drive from Shelburne Farms to Route 7 for the first time on that road, even for the first time, they would say, well, the constraint in the road is obviously a railroad bridge. And I didn't see a solution to that. I might have missed that. But um, if anybody's going to get killed on Bay Road, hurt on Bay Road, or have a problem on Bay Road, it's obviously the railroad <coughs> bridge. So solve that first. Um, then my next observation is the next constraint is obviously the bridge over the Platte River. If you fix that, then you're not tearing up anybody's front yard. Um, then if you do those minor steps after that and fix each constraint along the way, you'll get to your destination point without really involving people's land. I mean, you're, you're doing window dressing until you fix the two biggest problems on that road. Did you see my notes here? I didn't see the notes, sorry. That's just an observation. I'm not, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you, Bill. All right, uh, please. Uh, good evening, I'm Steve Bayetti. I live at 322 Bay Road. Um, uh, one additional thing is uh, the word massive was used tonight. It was also used in the March 28th meeting, and we had hoped that we would see something today that was less. But we still have those big parts of it, it cutting through many of the front lawns, still 10 feet wide, uh, and the, the buffer is on the new plan. You have to use a magnifying glass if you download it, but it's, it's actually it's a drainage ditch, which brings up a good point. The drainage ditch is kind of problematic in and of itself because that can catch tires. It's right next to the road where the bicyclists will be going, or car tires. 
but there's a very high water table. And uh, anyone who walks the road knows it or owns property to it, it always puddles. And consequently, we're putting in a new infrastructure, a big, I wish the engineer was here to, to kind of enlighten us a little, a, a 1.7 mile structure. And there's a huge water table, at least in the, the, the upper end where we live. So uh, there'll be surprises. You know, the, 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 that's very, the hydrology stuff's very hard to predict. Uh, so if you're voting tonight on a plan, uh, I hope you've got a way to consider that. Um, um, I'll, I'll skip ahead to just saying that this road is 225 years old, and it's in the town records. Consequently, the town's grown up around it, and we're trying to retrofit a modern law, the mobility law, into a street that has a personality. It's got a poetry to it. That, that's why people love the road, because it is what it is. All the, ma the mailboxes don't match. The, the, uh, the, the, uh, the rods don't match on your surveys. People like the road. And in closing, I'd like to say, we, you know, we, there were five people that spent tens of hours just talking to your neighbors, and uh, nobody wanted it. No one could really understand why. You know, I think uh, a new campaign on mobility needs to be done if that's indeed where we want to go. But uh, we had 50 people from Bay Road alone agree with that the plan should be denied tonight, and uh, 90 overall of Shelburne residents. So we have the surveys. Thank you. And I'm, uh, you know, I don't think I signed that. I'll be 91. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Hey, I want to turn to the board. Could I see a raise of hands? How many people still haven't spoken who would like to speak? One, two, three, I see. And then we're going to have select board comments. So we have this down on the agenda for uh, one hour. I uh, would ask that the rest of the board indulge uh, everyone to give everybody an opportunity to speak. So we're going to go over. All right, so three people, please. You're up next. If you can sing a song for everyone, you get an extra two minutes. You don't want to hear that. <laughs> uh, so I'm Susan Dunning. I live at 52 Yacht Haven Drive. Um, and I, I want to first thank Dean for putting this all together because I think the presentation was, uh, was a good to hear the history and, and that I think is very helpful. I think uh, there are an awful lot of people that walk and, and ride along Bay Road and I think that we're slowly moving towards something that I think is um, good. I think we're obviously not there yet but um, I like and my neighbors that I've talked to have liked breaking it down into three segments. I think it's more doable. You can think about each segment individually. Um, the thoughts that I've heard is a question of why um, part of the sidewalk is concrete and why it's gra you know crushed gravel. Why not all crushed gravel? Why is there that change? Um, secondly, in terms of in front of houses, I think the, um, our concern or my concern is mostly for kids that are riding their bikes and then for people walking, not so much for the road bikers that are biking 30 miles or, or so. And so working more towards a six you know, foot sort of gravel, crushed gravel path to me makes sense with um, houses so close and limited space and you're getting off the road the kids and the people that you're most concerned about you know the the, the ones going slowly and are most vulnerable um, so so I think um, not having these very you know large um, width pass is a better choice um, and then I would propose putting up uh, for a bond vote again something about the, the bridge that crosses the La Platte River because I think that is unbelievably needed and that's what's going to get kids to be able to ride their bikes to school and you know for my neighborhood which is a, a fairly sizable neighborhood we're all driving our kids you know to school that's a lot of cars going back and forth you know in the morning and in the afternoon and um, and I think you need to replace that bridge to get those kids able to bike. 
Yeah, I think we need to replace the bridge too, Susan. Uh, before you go, though, I just wanted to make sure when you started out, did you have a question for that I should pose to Dean about sidewalks and oh, why just the, it's a crushed gravel? Yeah, the, the concrete versus the crushed gravel because the, the segments change, and I wasn't sure what the purpose of that was. I think the answer to the question is why is, this, is the sidewalk section proposed is um, in part due to the fact that it's a section that would have high usage because of the location of your neighborhood relative to the tie hall path, and some of the demand uh, is going to be people kids going to school by way of the tie hall path. So a higher volume facility, um, concrete or a hard surface is something that's more warranted than one that's not. It's also something that is more durable. It's also more costly to build than a gravel path would be, but it's easier to maintain. So it would be a higher upfront investment to deal with a higher level of usage, but it would require less ongoing maintenance and it would last a longer period of time. Thank you, Dean. I saw two other people had their hands up. Uh, wait, you've already spoken. Oh, no, no, you haven't. I'm sorry. Of course, Wendy, please. This is our head of our uh, bike and ped path committee, Wendy Seville. How are you? Very well, thank you. So the bike and pedestrian path committee supports some new measures to be taken on Bay Road. I think we, most people can admit that it's not safe for walkers, it's not safe for bicyclists. It's also a road that's used by other people, not just residents of Bay Road. I live on Monfilo Road. There was a new sidewalk put in, people said, oh, you must be so upset, there's gonna be a sidewalk going by your house. It was wonderful, it's wonderful, everybody loves it. It's safer for children. The number of children who live in that neighborhood with Bayfield and Yacht Haven, who cannot ride to activities at the school, cannot ride to ball fields, tennis courts, soccer fields, because it's not safe. So I think it's unfortunate um, that that road, and I, I appreciate that people's homes are close, and I, I'm, I, I think it's just kind of, that's where your home is, and that's where the road is, and it's a very popular, route to Shelburne Farms, to the fishing access, to the lake access. And the reality is, it's a popular road. And other people w would like to use it. Um, my other comment is that the committee supports the segment idea with a big caveat that the bridge over the La Plata's got to be dealed with, dealt with, because otherwise it's, it's not really a, doesn't seem to be a workable solution. So Thank thanks. You, Wendy. And I'll be leaving before the rest of you. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you're ready. And I'm the last guy. <laughs> I'll talk for a long time. Mike, Michael Coper, 886 Bay Road. I believe you guys should pause because there's now there's 52 signatures I haven't had a chance to sign yet. And almost everybody who lives on Bay Road is not ready for it. The stress that's going on, I've heard from more neighbors in the last few weeks, and I have in the 20 years I've lived there. Right now, you should be thinking of the town's budget. Being a litigator, you know when you go into eminent domain, you I'm never- only one of five here. <laughs> okay, but you know that there, you never know what's gonna cost you. The appraiser does his appraisal, you put the money up, everybody says that's way too little, you've damaged me way too much, and you find out how much it really costs the town, a year or two after you've com completed your project. So that's one thing. And I think by the amount of stress that's on Bay Road, there'll be some litigation. Litigation does not come in your grant. Unless you settle the people down and make them feel that somehow it's gonna be good for everybody, now the 50 or 60 or 70 people that are being directly affected all have voiced an opinion that they're not ready. If you guys are ready, that means you are not paying attention to the most affected people. So I believe if you want to bring people down to the bay. Now, I was here 10 years ago when they made the launch ramp bigger. One sleepy little launch ramp. Let's do three. The wildlife people said it's fantastic. It's going to be great. I think it's a calamity having all these people down there. I can't get out of my driveway. There's people from Quebec. There's people from everywhere. But there's some of the Shelburne guys who want to go down there anymore because there's just too many people. If you 
put the bike path down the road, you'll have 15 people at one time coming down in their spandex, flying down, because it'll be on Whoa. some, it, it, it'll, <laughs> hold on, it'll be on some map somewhere that you should, if you want to enjoy Vermont, come down Bay Road on your bike. That's not what we signed up for, even though the mobility part has the word safety in it. It will not be safe. When you bring in another 50, 100 trips a day, maybe more, coming down that road, people are speeding, and there's ways to stop speeding. These guys have not put the right money towards that. Uh, I think that at this time going forward, not only will you cause more stress, because nobody knows how they're going to be effective, you may be setting yourself up for when you do your environmentals, somebody will sue your environmentals. And there'll be ways to stall this that the set-aside money or use it or lose it money will go away. If you make everybody happy that they are being listened to and somehow their concerns are being mitigated somehow, then there's a chance that this project goes to fruition, not just use the money up for consultants because you had it. I've been involved in a lot of eminent domain. I'm in the real estate business. It does not act end the way people think it's going to when they start it. So I think caution right now until the people that are most effective feel like they're being treated properly was the best way to go. Thank, Thank you, Mike. Has everyone, hold on please, hold on. Has any, everyone here had an opportunity to speak other than this gentleman? Or, or you want to speak too? Why don't you go? <laughs> um, I'm Doris uh, Laramie. I live at six, well, my sister lives at 653, but I grew up in the big white farmhouse, okay, on the um, west side of the um, railroad. And I've lived there now for over 50, or lived there for 50 years, traveled the road bicycling. And I will tell you that two cars can go through that railroad bridge. Just everybody has to slow down. And a two trucks, I'm telling you right now, can go through there and no problem if everybody stays on their side and slows down. The we problem being- We had one being, truck get stuck just the, you know, a couple weeks ago. Oh yeah, that's because they don't read the sign saying the bridge is only like, what, uh, 512 or five, whatever, okay, yeah. So that's the driver's fault. I, it know. was, <laughs> okay, but so, go ahead, sorry. But yeah, and I understand that. Lived there and never had truck problems until the last probably four or five years since I've been there and I'm gonna be 60. So um, I just, I know the bike pass is a great thing, but Bay Road is not a road to be, if you wanna, I would not put my kid on Bay Road to travel down there. It's, it wasn't safe when I was growing up. It was really very difficult. And I know that there's a road or a path that goes from Bay Road over to come into town, and I'm assuming that's where some of these kids will be traveling after they go across the bridge. But if they're gonna travel the rest of the way to Shelburne Farms and go, it's just not safe. And even on Harbor Road, it's not a good road. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much, there. Doris. And you're the last one. I was just go, could you just use the mic, please? I'm sorry. <laughs> I was just going to mention. And identify yourself. <laughs> I'm Randy Shover, 399 Bay Road. Thanks, Randy. I was just going to mention the tractor trailer truck. That if somebody was coming through that bridge that night, they would be here. You're absolutely correct. So, the this, pictures were this project should be paused just because of that right okay. there. Thank you very much, Randy. All right, so everyone's had an opportunity to speak. One of the things that the select board as a group wanted to make sure is that everyone had noticed that this process was going forward. Everyone had an opportunity to be heard. We, uh, the consultant provided us with three alternatives at our meeting about, um, month ago or so, and I th for anyone who attended that meeting, uh, you know that the select board was not satisfied with any of the three uh, alternatives. As a result, uh, the consultant came back with a revised plan. We've now heard from you, and now I'm gonna turn to each of our select board members and give everyone an opportunity uh, to make any comments uh, they might have. So.
So uh, who wants to start? I'll be the quickest. Okay, Colleen. And since, unfortunately, with the starting time as being six, then I missed the majority of the presentation and the comments, but just the 25 minutes that I did here. Uh, you know, I, going into this, my concern was, um, has already been voiced by many of you, and that's the bottleneck at the bridge. And I'm talking about both bridges. And I think until um, Vermont Rail and the state decide what to do with the rail bridge, then it's hard to um, plan on any type of path. They may have to be redone. Um, and then again, just the um, the Bay Road Bridge, meaning the uh, the one that cars go over. Um, you know that needs to be our number one priority. And as far as like projects in general, the way that I approach it is number one whether there's money to do it, and um, and and but more of a priority is whether there's community support. I think there's support for some type of path, but clearly not this one. Um, in its current form, and right now, I you know it's we just finished, or it seems like we just finished um, all of our budget meetings, and I and it feels like we're about to start again. And it's hard to imagine trying to get together money um, for a path that nobody's happy with, and with two really huge glaring problems. Thank you very much, Colleen. John, what do you think? Um, well, I think that everyone. Uh, thank you for. Um, communicating the obvious. Um, I think the consultant did do a better job of um, kind of breaking this into sections, uh, although what we see, um, you know, we don't influence this. We just see the product like you see it. Um, it you know, it's, it's a little varied and it doesn't make sense. Um, without addressing the uh, two bridges, um, it's kind of like building a dead end road, if I can term it like that. And uh, as Colleen said, you could build that road and then have to redo it because something changed in the bridge or the layout of the road or something like that. So uh, I think that uh, we're farther along in our thinking. I think it's obvious that uh, some portions of this would be helpful, but I don't see uh, without the, the whole picture being done, uh, the reason to even think about starting this. So. Um, that's kind of where I'm camped. Thanks, John. Jerry, your thoughts, please. Yeah, I agree with both uh, John and Colleen. I, I do think that the uh, consultant responded to some of the criticism, uh, a piece of which was mine to some degree, but it's, uh, you have to recognize the compelling uh, concern about the two uh, uh, pressure points of bridge of bridges and until they're addressed I couldn't agree more uh, I think we uh, uh, we could use our time uh, more productively uh, addressing them thank you Jerry Josh your thoughts please yeah I think um, you've all raised some very reasonable uh, concerns I, one that I'm still not sure about and if either Dean, you, or, or Joe can clarify for me the whole issue about right-of-way. I mean, people, a lot of people talked about things being close to the house, and I don't think I really understand. I think somebody mentioned eminent domain. I think clarifying how that, you know, where, you know, taking people's front yards, how does that fit with right-of-ways and I don't, I, I'm, no, not, I start not off by that, saying, no. I mean, we are a long ways away from any real conversation about that. Part of the scoping study did not include a survey. Mm -hmm. I think the intent of what is being presented is that everything is within the uh, town road right away. I certainly would not be able to confirm that without a survey. A survey is not part of this project. Um, so that's where that conversation kind of starts and stops it's okay just a, that would be a a next step um, in I, the process let me jump in to try to help answer that too I've uh, done a lot of work uh, to try to get more information about this and uh, last Friday at the fire and rescue banquet I spoke not only with Joe but with our head of our uh, road department who informed me that there is still some confusion among some people about how many rods the road is. And it changes, apparently, from three rods to four ro rods. So it's difficult. There is from, you know, someone mentioned uh, eminent uh, domain. But th there are 
laws, I can tell you in regard to the right of way and the town's right to do something in there. That said, I don't think anyone on this board has ever endorsed the idea of ever putting a uh, path on Bay Road that goes within eight feet of someone's front door. I just, that's inconceivable to me. So, and I think everyone on this board uh, feels the same way without asking them. I see nodding heads. So that, that's to try to clarify some of uh, Josh's question, I think. So anything more? No, that's it. Okay, so uh, here are my thoughts uh, about this. Uh, you can't put the cart before the horse. And here the two overriding issues that must be addressed first are the train overpass and the La Platte Bridge. Now, in regard to the train overpass, there is an agreement between the state and the railroad that provides that the railroad will be responsible for maintenance of the bridge. And this is an issue that has arisen during the litigation and it is, uh, I'll be quick because there are some recusal issues I want to avoid. So that, that's an issue, but the bottom line is that bridge needs to be addressed. That overpass must be addressed. It is unsafe. It is falling apart. When that truck went through, you made a great point. When that truck went through, I got a, uh, my son-in-law's on the fire department. He came over that night, told me what had happened. I called John who lives right there, he went down, took pictures, and sent me pictures that night. He jumps on things right away. And it, it's incredible, the damage that was already existing then only got worse when a truck hit it. There are pieces, chunks of the bridge that have fallen down over the last year, two years. It is in terrible condition. Then you look at the La Platte River Bridge, Years ago, and I was on the select board in, uh, in 2010 when we chose preferred alternative five, which by the way rose, uh, raised the bridge up a foot and also provided sight lines to make it safer on both sides of the bridge. It was the most expensive of the, of the options, but it, we felt at the time universally, it was a five nothing vote, that that was the safety of our community uh, was primary. And so if that issue does arise again for a bond vote, please consider how important it is because Bay Road needs to be addressed. And we need to address the La Platte River Bridge and the train overpass first. But I also urge all of you to take a look at the town plan. The town plan is our Bible. This is what the Planning Commission uses to draft its bylaws to give to the select board for approval. This is how we plan according to the town plan. Our current town plan provides for connectivity between neighborhoods. That's one of our goals. It provides for increasing bicycle uh, traffic and pedestrian uh, connectivity. So we are obligated to try to follow that town plan whenever feasible. It just so happens our town plan is up to be amended and must be amended by, Dean, it's 2018 sometime? February 2019. F February 2019. The meetings of the Planning Commission, they're coming before us later tonight, you, you'll hear that the Planning Commission is going to address the town plan. If you want to impact Bay Road or other roads in town for the long term, I urge you to go before the Planning Commission to make your thoughts known. Now, I will tell you, I am personally in favor of bicycles and trying to provide for connectivity. I think we must provide for safety of our pedestrians. I also am a huge believer in private property rights, and there has to be a balance between all of those things. But if you don't go before the Planning Commission when the town plan is being discussed, and then you come at the last second 
when your particular item is up, it makes it very difficult to satisfy what your personal views are on that one item when you could have addressed it during the formation stages. So I'm just giving you a heads up, please go before the Planning Commission when they have these talks. We have to do something in regard to Bay Road. It's not safe. It's simply not safe. Do I think this is the right thing at this time? No, I don't. I don't think we can address it until we know if that overpass is going to be fixed, and if so, how is it going to be fixed? And I don't think we can address this until the La Platte River Bridge is addressed. Are we going to build it so we do have a bicycle lane on the bridge, or won't there be a bicycle lane? That's going to impact what we do on each side. So I, and then of course there's funding. We're talking about something that might not happen for 10 years. There's going to be five different people in all likelihood on this board in, in 10 years. So I th thank the consultant, frankly, because the consultant is, is doing her job. And she did a good job in listening to everyone here, so I don't want to blame the consultant here. She did a good job, and she changed it. Now, is it sufficient? Not for me. And I'm betting based on these comments, not for anyone else on, on this board. But it's a problem that's not going away, and we're going to have to do something. So this issue will not go away. I personally am in favor of a motion that deems the project complete, that the board does not choose a preferred alternative at this time, and ask that the consultant simply send us her final report. Second. So could you move that? Move that. I'll second. Moved in a fight for second. Who got second? She did. Colleen got <laughs> second. We have a motion. Was anyone like to uh, make any comments uh, about the motion at this time on the board? Anyone here? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. I want to thank everybody for coming in, and I really thank everyone for the civility that was demonstrated tonight. This is a highly emotional issue. It could have gotten out of hand. And you people were great, so thank you very much. And Dean found out 36 hours ago that he was going to be giving this presentation. He did a great job. Great job. Dean. All right, we're going to take a moment before we go forward. Thank you.